It is my distinct pleasure to introduce to you the world-renowned technical advisor of Chris Craft Commander Club, <laughs> Hold on, Lee Dollin. Lee, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Actually, I did not stay aboard a beautiful 42 commander. The idea behind this whole program was not for me personally to come teach you everything I know, but the idea was for me to come give you knowledge, to give you thoughts, to give you ideas, and to, to make you just stop and think about your current program, see if it's good for you, does it work for you. Are you spending too much money? Are you spending not enough money? Um, and that's what I intend to do today. The first part is basically going to be working with scheduled maintenance, how to spot a, a good technician, how to spot a bad technician, how to spot a bad job, a bad repair job. I also brought along a good many of the tools that we talk about on the forum. I actually brought my whole office with me, but I'm not going to drag it out. Uh, but stuff that we've talked about on the forum that you may have heard about but haven't seen. Um, stuff that you may have heard about and seen but never actually looked at up close, held it. I'm going to pass some stuff around and let you look at it. Um, so the, the whole idea is not, not that we're going to come in here and we're going to fix all your problems. Because that's not going to happen. We'll try. We'll discuss. The uh, second seminar is basically, I, I entitled it Free For All just for that reason. If you've got something specific on your boat that you're having an issue with, this would be more like a live Chris Craft Forum. You can throw it out here and I'll bet between the crowd that's in here, somebody's going to come up with an answer and say, I had that happen. So feel free to ask questions. Uh, I brought along a lot of pictures. Uh, if, if you recognize your boat, don't worry, I'm not going to call you out. <laughs> if, you, uh, if, if you recognize some stuff that's, that's really, really ugly that you see aboard your boat, make notes. If you didn't bring something to make notes with, everybody's got a free notepad sitting in front of them. And that's, uh, that's also magnetic. You take it home and stick it on your refrigerator. If you need extras, I've got extras. You can see me after the seminar. But... Uh, Let's get on with the program, and the first part that we're going to talk about is maintenance schedules. Okay, Let's see if this is going to work first. There we go. Maintenance schedules are all about planning, they're all about saving money, they're all about keeping your engine in top shape, but they're also about keeping your boat in top shape. They're, they're important just for that reason. By working on it, by working on a schedule, you know you're keeping everything in, in good shape. And, and you just look at the commanders down here on the docks and you know they're in great shape. They're in great shape because they're kept that way, but maintenance schedules will also extend the life of your engines. How many in here have hour meters on their engines? So everybody's got a pretty good feel for what shape their engine's in, right? Wrong. Everybody knows how many hours that key's been turned on. But we've seen 38 commanders specifically with 427s exceed 3,000, 3,500, and one I know of that has exceeded 4,000 without a rebuild. 4,000 hours on a 427. It can be done. It's all about how you take care of your equipment. You throw it in and you follow the old phrase that you hear, road hard and put up wet, it's going to last you about half as long as it should. If you keep it on a schedule, you go through it, you love on it, you adjust it, you keep everything up. Just so, you're going to set records with the hour meter. Um, how many in here have heard the name Todd Heinrich? Todd's one of the founders of this club. It was Todd's boat, Grow Seal, that popped four grand on the hour meter. And Todd would tell you, before he sold that boat, he had no problem with cruising, how long, Scott? Two weeks? 
they could jump on that boat, they could cruise two weeks all through the Great Lakes. They did it every year. You never heard Todd talk about breakdowns. Mm -hmm. By staying on the schedule, you're also going to decrease your overall cost. Anybody got an idea how you can do that? Any ideas? Fixing it before it breaks. Fixing it before it breaks. Or? You came to the rendezvous this weekend, you pulled into King's Marina, something broke. Whose rate are you going to pay? The one at your home or the one where you're visiting? It can get expensive when you're out there cruising. So that's, that's the most important reasons for making schedules. They're easy to set up. You know, I, my schedules are set up on spreadsheets. Um, yeah, just simple tasks, tune-ups, oil changes, adjustments, timing, all the way down to shaft logs, when's the last time the stuffing box was packed. Every single thing about your boat, you need to know it. You need to know when it was serviced. You need to know when it needs to be serviced. Hour meters. I asked y'all a few minutes ago how many have an hour meter on their boat. Now, everybody, just about everybody raised their hand. So here's the next question. How many in here think their hour meter is accurate? <laughs> okay. Got a couple of you, so that means that, that means you're staying on top of it. Hour meters, in my personal opinion, they're only good for one thing. They're easily installed, of course. They're wired to the ignition system, so if you leave the key on for some reason, that, that clock's still ticking. If you're buying a boat, those hour meters, you should treat them as if they tell you nothing about the history of those engines. They should only be used for your maintenance schedule. You know how many, uh, you know how many hours you should be changing your oil? You know how many hours you should be changing your filters? You know how many hours you should be doing fuel filters? You should know belts, hoses, etc. This is where I base my schedules on. Now, I'm on an inland lake that's fresh water. They boat 365 days a year. We're, we're very lucky in that aspect. But we, we still have seasons, so our rule of thumb at home on oil changes on any gas engine is going to be once every 50 hours or once a season, whichever one has, whichever one comes first. So most of the time, my people at home are going off their hour meter. Now, why do they tell you nothing reliable about the past? If you own a commander, you're an absolute purist. First off, you know the cable-driven tacks are about as accurate as the Stone Age to begin with. They could, they could bounce anywhere from five to 700 RPMs just sitting still. Um, but the hour meters were probably not reset when the engines were put in. By now, very few commanders haven't been repowered. There are a few. So, if you're buying one, forget the hour meter. It's not going to tell you what you want to know. What's going to tell you what you want to know is, is by actually doing testing. And we'll get into that shortly. Planning is the importance of maintenance. You don't want to spend your summertime, you don't want to spend your on the water time working on your boat. Um, I have one customer in particular, I love the planning. I work under a circus pig top every winter. 38 Commander with a shrink wrap. That boat transforms into the biggest workshop you've ever seen as soon as it comes out of the water for the winter. Because they zip the door in. All shrink wrap is Set the door panel in, we go in, set up a propane heater, and from basically from December or January to April, all the work's going on. All the big projects are going on. April comes around, shrink wrap gets cut in the water and she's gone. Except for little odds and ends, that's uh that's all that happens in the wintertime. They get to spend the summertime on the water. And that's that's the important part. What to look for in a service facility? <clears throat> a 
Some of this is going to be personal opinion. Some of this is going to be pro uh, professional common sense. But let's talk about it anyway, because in this day and age of this economy, saving money is all more important. But protecting yourself is way more important than saving a little bit of money on the economy. First thing you want to know about your insurance facility is, are they insured? How many people in here know 100% for a fact that the service facility they're using is fully insured to cover them and you? Got two, got three, got four. Okay, I'm going to stop this PowerPoint for just a second because I want to show you all something. This is something that you can ask for. As a customer, anytime you want to see it from your service facility, it's called Certificate of Liability Insurance. It's free, it costs nothing. Every marina that I work in, whether it's on my own boat or whether it's on somebody else's boat, before I can step foot in that marina, they want me to provide them with a Certificate of Liability Insurance. What that does, is it shows who I am, where I'm from, who my insurance agent is, where they're from, who the carrier is. But more importantly, it also shows them the coverages. <coughs> and the coverages that the marinas are concerned with are simple. They want to know about your general aggregate policy. How much are you covered in your liability? In your liability? And then the one underneath of it is product liability. Product liability means I may have done the work right, but I may have put a defective part on. If that defective part causes a problem, that's where the product liability comes in. Finally, you know, you look at that and go, well, you can print those off. No, you can't print them off. They have to be faxed in from the insurance company. And down on the left-hand side, you'll see certificate holder. Each certificate is made for each particular marina that I work in. And until each marina that I work in has a copy of that, I can't carry my tool bag in through the door. Any questions? What about work comp? I only have work comp if I have employees. Don't have employees. I'm a single man. At least till October. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's mid-October. <clears throat> All right. Lee? So, Lee? Yes, sir? Would it be advisable to have your name as an endorsement if you were having some major work done? You get it. You, uh, all you need to have that for is your peace of mind if you want it. Customers, I'll be honest, customers never ask me for one. The marinas ask me for one. You know, I can go work on your boat tomorrow, but as soon as the marina finds out there's an outside contractor on their property, they want that. If you don't have that, you're not coming through the gate. Um, the reason I bring it up today is just simply knowledge again. You don't have to ask your service facility for this. You can ask him if he's covered. If he tells you he's covered, you know, you can say, okay, he's covered. If he can hand you a sheet, then you know he's covered. If it comes down to the brass tax of liability later on, and you end up in a courtroom for some reason, you take that last sentence I use and you follow it with, with your honor. The sentence where I said, well, he told me he was covered, your honor. How well is that going to hold up? It won't. So, you know, I'm, I'm not going to require every contractor I have to work on my boat or my house or whatever unless we start getting into some major work. If we start getting into some major work, or let's say we're working on fuel systems or we're working on electrical or what I would consider a high liability item, then I might press you a little bit for a certificate. I want to see it. I want to see what your coverage is. If he's just coming down to change the oil, probably not. Any other questions? Hey, you know, I'm not going to lie. Everybody knows. Everybody wants to sue everybody else. It's just 
the hard facts of life these days. Uh, how many of you know exactly how much liability insurance you have on your boat right now? <coughs> now, how many should know how many have liability insurance on their boat? General policies are normally, what, around 300000 Take a look out that window right there and tell me 300000 is going to cover you if your boat blows up. It's not. It's not meant to. It's what no, it's what your boat protects you against somebody else's or property. You know, you our our coverage is as good as it gets, I'm not gonna lie. I mean you can go out and you can buy a couple million dollars umbrella if you want to. And I do know people that do for their safety they buy an umbrella policy. But just you know, the reason I bring all this up is plain and simple. We don't think about this when we jump down in the engine room and we do stuff. We don't think about this when we go pull out wiring and start changing out outlets and changing out breakers and changing out fuel filters and changing out, you know, we're focused on getting our boat fixed. We're focused on what we need to do to fix the problem to go enjoy our boat. The percentage is low that anything will happen. But it's like I've always said since I was a kid, the way my luck runs, I always hit the odds. I just haven't hit the lottery yet. So, you know, liability is just a thing you really got to think about these days. Whether you're working on your boat or whether you're working on your buddy's boat, it's just something you have to keep in mind. New boat dealer. Anybody want to take a guess why that item's in there? Just, just a guess. Why would I? Why would you want to know if they're a new boat dealer or not? Established, established um, record or overhead. New boat dealers are generally keeping themselves afloat in the service department. Who's out there buying new boats these days? Very few. <coughs> but here's here's a little secret about the boat business. So I worked for a dealer for many years. I worked for several dealers many years. They work on the floor plan. Everybody knows what a floor plan is? They get the boats on consignment. They make the interest payments on the boat till the boat's sold. I have marinas on my lake at home right now that sell Regal, that sell, uh, I've actually got a Sunseeker dealer at home on an inland lake in North Carolina, for God's sakes. I will never understand why I have a Sunseeker dealer at home, but I do. I have Tiara, I have Bayliner, I have, I have them all. I had, I had two Chris Craft dealers. They have since gone by the wayside. But their service rates in their shop is 105 bucks an hour. That's, doesn't matter whether they're changing oil or changing engines, it's 105 bucks an hour. And then I've got other marinas on my lake that don't sell new boats. Most of them are selling consignment these days. That seems to be where the market is. The guy who really wants to sell his boat, go put it up on this guy's lot. It won't cost you anything unless he sells it. If he sells it, then you're going to give him 10%. His service rate is 60 bucks an hour. Who's winning in the business? The guy that's on consignment, not the new boat dealer. Now, it doesn't mean it's always that way. It's just something to look for when you're when you're choosing service facilities. What's his overhead look like? Has he got a great big brand new flashy stucco sided building with a whole bunch of high end boats out front? You're probably going to help him keep them in the service department. <coughs> Number three in a service facility: referrals, 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 referrals. I do not spend a single penny on advertising. I won't do it. I let my work speak for itself. I let my customers advertise for me. The guy that has a half page ad in the yellow pages is the same guy that's got all the new boats out front. You're paying for that too. And that's usually the guy that your friends are going to say, man, I took my boat there last week. Oh, they stuck it to me. Referrals. You guys have a million friends in this club. Well, they've got 12, 1,300 anyway. There's probably not a place in this country you can go right now where you couldn't get on the club and say, I'm in 
Grove Seal, Michigan. I've lost a water pump. Where do I need to go? You'll have a handful of people come in and tell you. I'm in Chesapeake Bay. I'm in South Chesapeake Bay near Norfolk. You'll have a handful come in and tell you there. That's some of the benefits of this club is you have, you have the referrals. You can get the referrals. Remember that the flashy ads will only tell you what they want you to know. Referrals and your friends will tell you what you need to hear. Plain and simple. And again, if you need it, get a certificate of insurance. Mechanics versus technicians. I posted on this one time. And, and it grabbed a lot of traction and people kind of like it, so I'm going to say it again. A mechanic is a parts changer. He's focused on one thing. He wants to get in there, fix the problem, change the part, get his check, go home. A technician is what I call the NCIS of boat mechanics. A technician wants to get in there and he wants to find out what caused it to fail in the first place. Then fix the problem then find out how we prevent it from happening again. And before he leaves the job, he sits down with the customer and says, Here's what failed, here's why it failed, and here's, what, here's how it will fail again if it happens. Here's what will cause it. Interview your mechanics. Don't be afraid to be the boss. You guys hold the checkbooks. You guys hold the money. Guy comes down and he says he can fix your boat in five minutes. Have him sit down and give him a cup of coffee and say, let's talk about what you've done. Let's talk about where you've been. Let's talk about how many years you've got in this business. Let's talk about your insurance. Don't be afraid to interview them. These people have too much money invested in your boats to let Johnny Shade Tree come down here with his coveralls and an adjustable wrench and start fixing on your boat because he's 40 bucks an hour. If it's 40 bucks an hour, that should be the first flag if the market's bringing 80. Finally, gut feelings. Anybody that knows me knows it doesn't matter whether it has to do with a boat, a motor, a problem, or a personal issue. My gut never lies to me. If my gut starts hurting, there's something wrong. If, uh, if, if my, my mechanic's doing something on my boat or my technician's doing something on my boat and I just don't feel good about it, I'm going to be the first one to step up and say, hold on. I understand you're working by the hour, but it's a little more important that you sit down and explain to me exactly what you're doing and why you're doing it, because I don't feel good about this. If they can't do it, thank you for your time. Don't need you anymore. Have a nice day. Off the boat. So, if you don't feel good about it, there's probably a reason. Go with your gut. Now we're going to get into some of the stuff that I have seen. Patchwork. It's easy to spot. It's never safely done, and it's never a good permanent fix. You might get the problem fixed for $15 or $20, but it's going to be fixed again. It's going to be fixed again. It's going to be fixed again until it's fixed right. The old saying a friend of mine told me once, if you don't have time to do it right the first time, how much time do you have to do it again? That's always a good way to look at things when you're fixing it. <laughs> this is a distributor cap, and I know it's a little tough to see. If you look right in here, you'll see a blob of silicone. That blob of silicone is because it's an automotive style cap that fits on the marine distributor. The reason that blob of silicone is there is because on an automotive cap, the caps are vented. They have a hole in them. You can't have a vented cap on a boat. First off, it's illegal. Second off, it's unsafe. But this guy decided he's going to save probably $15 to $20 on this distributor cap. Take a tube of silicone, smear it over the hole, put it on, down the road we go. No problem. So about three months later, the silicone starts flying apart the shavings and the rotor starts swinging it around everywhere and the motor starts running like total crap. You take off the distributor and you've got about five million shavings stuck to every electrode inside the distributor. So first off, 
there are certain parts on a boat that by law must be marine grade. Alternators, carburetors, distributor caps, starters. Those are the biggest right off the bat. Fuel pumps too. Yeah, fuel, fuel pumps. pumps. Today. No. Flame arresters. Yes, I can't count the number of times I've seen the new K&N cold air intake filters on a gas engine in a boat. Can't use them. k and is great for diesels. You can use those all day long. I don't want a gas motor. But marine grade parts will always have a U.S. Coast Guard approval number on them or a marine J-spec number. Certain starters will, will actually have a sticker on them that says marine with a J like 1395. Um, your flame arresters must have a Coast Guard approval number stamped on them. Your fire extinguishers must have a Coast Guard approval number stamped on them. Um, your alternators, they not only have to have the Marine sticker, but the other easiest way to spot is look on the back, there should be a fire screen or a spark screen on the back of it. Maybe inside, but it's a very fine mesh screen on it. Items like that absolutely positively have to be Marine grade. You're not going to save money. Fuel pumps. Uh, the biggest question I have is what's the difference between a marine fuel pump and an automotive fuel pump? It's a double diaphragm system. It's plain and simple. You have two diaphragms. On your car, the bottom of your engine area is open. If the fuel pump fails, gas comes out, drops on the ground. There's no, there's a hazard, but it's not as big a hazard. On a marine fuel pump, you have a double diaphragm system on it. If the, first, if, if the main diaphragm fails, the double diaphragm keeps it contained within the pump. And then you've got a little pipe that comes out the side with a clear piece of hose that goes up to your carburetor. How many people have that hose hooked up to your carburetor? How many people don't do it? Like a fuel pump. You don't have one. Yeah, don't worry at all. If you have if you have that fitting coming from the fuel pump, and even if your carburetor doesn't have a fitting, you can put a fitting on the flame arrestor. The object is is that that fitting has to come up to the carburetor, dump fuel into the carburetor. You'd rather it flood the engine than flood the engine room. That's the idea behind it. Same thing with marine carburetors on gas engines. The, the biggest difference you see in a marine carburetor is what's called the overflow tube. On a car, the overflow tube comes straight up. On a quadrajet, it comes straight up and it's cut flush. On a marine carburetor, that quadrajet either comes up and is miter cut at an angle, or it has a loop in it. So that when that overflows, fuel doesn't go out over the engine. Fuel goes right back down the throat and floods the engine. <clears throat> It's just some of the safety issues that make them more expensive. Any questions? Morning. Yeah. 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 Fuel pump doesn't have set two, but they are the correct. But I was told those fuel pumps, the the rare birds on the 327Q, they're internally bound so that they go back in a crankcase right. if they puke. Yep. Is that right? Yep. Yep. It's Some of them are internally vented. Very hard to get. Earl the Pearl has them in my Yeah, ones. I got one spare. I got. Well, let me tell you, Q people, something. If you have not built up a warehouse of parts for these Qs yet, get started. Can I kid you not? That's a big expense. Yeah, and take them. You got to I'm, I'm not going to ask the obvious question about the electric pump, but I am going to make the comment. If you have electric pumps on your boat, two things. First off, they must be marine grade. They must have a Coast Guard approval number on them. Second thing is, they need to have an oil pressure shutoff switch mounted. And the reason for both of these, the first one is, it's an electric pump. Anything electric that's in your engine room has to be approved by the Coast Guard, period, blank, period point blank. The reason for the oil pressure shutoff, you're running down the road, the uh, engine fails, but the pump doesn't. The oil pressure switch will cut the pump off. And you always do that just as an extra safety measure. It's not required in every installation. It's just a safety measure that will give you peace of mind that if you're running down the river and that engine quits, you don't have to take that extra step to think, okay, I gotta turn the key off to make sure the fuel pump stops pumping. So 
Oil pressure, oil pressure switch. Uh, not on that topic, but going back a second. I thought I heard you say that fire extinguishers have to have the U.S. Coast Guard Marines approved stamp on them. That is correct. Yeah. Now, are you talking about the engine hold fire extinguisher system, or are you talking about the handhelds? Any, folk, any fire extinguisher system aboard your boat will have a Coast Guard approval number somewhere on it if it's a marine system. Doesn't matter whether it's halon, dry chemical, foam, or otherwise. Okay, we'll back up now. Now, when you're talking about a portable, go to Walmart. Uh -huh. Does that suffice? Or do you have to buy a marine handheld? You can buy a marine fire extinguisher at Walmart. But I'm saying, is there a difference between getting the red one and the yep. white one? Yep. And in, 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 in my 15 years of working with Coast Guard Auxiliary and doing safety checks, I will tell you, the ones that say kitty kitchen fire extinguisher on them, you're not going to find a Coast Guard approval number on them. Coast Guard approval number will always be, well, always, 95% of the time will be printed right on the label stamp somewhere. It will say USCG approval number, and it will have a number beside it. Uh, normally on the front of the box it will say, if, there, if it came in a box, on the box it will say Coast Guard approved. Uh, but if you're out here and they check your fire extinguishers, if the law enforcement is really looking to write a ticket, they're going to look for that number. Because they know you can hold up two red fire extinguishers and they go, yeah I got them. No, no, I need to see them. Since we're taking a moment on fire extinguishers, let me also tell you, twice a season, I want y'all to do one thing for me. Take your fire extinguishers out of the mount, turn them upside down, and see if you feel the dry chemical drop. If you don't, shake them. Dry chemical tends to cake down at the bottom of a fire extinguisher that's been left in the mount for a long time. Take it out, turn it upside down. You should, it should feel just like a sand bottle. You should just feel a whole bunch of them drop. And just turn it back and forth a couple of times, check the pressure gauge, put it back in the mount. You're good for another six months. If you don't have a pressure gauge on your extinguisher, you will find a little green button somewhere sticking out. That is a pressure gauge. You take that green button, you push it in with your thumb or your finger. If that green button pops all the way back out, your pressure's good. If the green button doesn't pop out, off the boat it goes. Um, other safety gear. How many in here know that flares have an ex expiration date on them? Okay, I don't need to go through that one, do I? What do you do? What What do you absolutely positively have to do if your flares are expired? Buy new ones. What do you do with the old ones? Shoot alarms. Use it. Use it to light the build. <laughs> Okay, show of hands. How many keep them? How many get rid of them? Keep them. Keep them. Keep them at least for a couple more years. I'd rather have too many with the possibility that a couple don't work than not have enough and watch a boat go by in the middle of the night. Our uh, local Coast Guard Auxiliary once a year will do a coordinated training session where you can shoot the old ones. I, you know, I wish they would all do that. I wish all flotillas would do that. And if, if you people know people in the auxiliary or the power squadron, suggest it. It gives people a chance to get some experience with the flares, and it's a way to dispose of the ones that are expired. So, all right. Let's see when I run out of slides here, because then I've got more. Here's a good patch job right here. It's blurry. But I know you can see it, and I've got a better shot of it also. This is an alternator. This is the adjusting bolt for the belt. This is the entire bolt for the belt. <laughs> Oops. And, uh, yeah, that's, that's the way the boat came to me, and that's the first thing I saw when I opened up the engine room. There's the other side of it. Now, somebody please tell me how that belt's going to stay tight. You know, it stays tight when it's sitting still, but the guy hasn't taken it out and ran it up to 38, 4,200 4, RPMs and watched all the vibration take effect. Uh, this was on a, a Mastercraft Stars and Stripes edition. They, they're not slow bruisers. They're, they know it's two speeds, stop and go. 
Okay, so that's the end of the PowerPoint. Now we can get on to some of the good pictures. Question. <coughs> Go ahead. Regarding that very same subject, uh -huh. I I've owned my boat 17 years. Okay. I'd like to think that I pretty much got a pretty good handle on everything that goes on downstairs. Uh -huh. Honest to God, I have to tighten my alternator belts on those cues at least twice a year. Yep. And I mean, they, I, I am not. <laughs> it's not a matter of not getting the bolts tight enough. They are tight, tight, tight. I've replaced belts. I've tried the best belts money could buy. They don't. They all they do on the queue is go directly to the pulley, which is on the flywheel, yep. to the alternator. There is no secondary mm -hmm. pulley. There's no nothing. What is causing? You know me. I'm not. They're going to stretch. They're going to stretch out. You're not going to avoid that. It's the belt that. stretching. Yeah. Mine I can't keep stretch out to the. The, end where the I other yeah, reason. Exactly. The other reason they stretch out is belts get hot. Right. I mean, rubber expands. Rubber contracts. Uh, my guess is if you checked it cold. Versus right. checked it after a run, right. you're going to see different tensions. I can notice on my on my voltmeter, especially port side. I'll look at my voltmeter halfway through the season, yeah. and I'll be down until I pick it up to about 15, 1800. I'm down at 11, 5, 12. The minute I pick her up, then all of a sudden that kicks in, and then I'm good. You still run an external regulator on your alternators? I got the original Presta lights. Yep. Yes. So and you're still exciting the alternators. Yeah. But yeah. <laughs> You know, think of it this way. Don't think of it as much as a nuisance. Think of it as a good reason I need to get out and check things around anyway. It's twice a season. It's not a big deal. As old as I'm getting getting down that port engine. You it's got a insane. son. I got a son. Yeah, he's bigger than me now. <laughs> it was great when Cameron was this big. I could shove him anywhere. Now, now he's calling me. Okay, so let's talk a little bit more about patch jobs. Let me get this first slide set up. Once it's set up, we'll be... Okay, so there's where we left off with the PowerPoint, the alternator. That's, by the way, anybody want to take a guess how much it would cost to fix this problem? Thank you. That's exactly what it cost. <laughs> Did I put it on there? Does anybody know what's involved in fixing a problem like that? I mean, you know, a lot of people look at that. It's a broken casting on an alternator. I'm doomed. It can't be fixed. All you have to do is take this to your local alternator rebuilder. They will take this front casting off right here, go over to their junk pile and pull another one out, slide it on, sandblast it, clean it, paint it out the door. You're done. It was 25 bucks to fix that all. But the, the guy that worked on the boat decided to let it go just like that. Yeah, but that mountain bowl was only 25 cents. <laughs> <laughs> and it's not even stainless. He right. Love, right. That. Love that. Anybody ever seen this trick before? See anything wrong with these two plugs? One's too wet. One's got too much sleeve. Sleeves. Yeah. See the thread size? Are you oh, kidding me? That's a GM plug to put into a Ford plate? No, that's a that's a stripped out spark plug hole that the guy got a self-cutting, self-tapping. You see the cross hatch in that thread right there. To, uh, to to jam the plug in the hole so that it would seal up and stay. And uh, what it looks like when you take it apart is that. Proper way to fix it, anybody? Helicoil. Helicoil. What's a helicoil? Helicoil is a little kit you can buy at any Napa Auto Parts. You're going to over drill the hole. This is not something I recommend everybody do, by the way, but this is how it's fixed. You oversize the hole, then you tap it, and then you're actually threading in a set of threads into the head with, with Loctite on it that reduces it back down to its original size. That's the proper way to fix it. Don't do it with the head still. Yeah. Yeah. I was just going to ask. Nah. <laughs> I mean, yeah, normally you want to do that. If you're stuck in a precarious situation, you can do it and Put a vacuum pump to the cylinder and try and suck the dust out. But yeah, I would always recommend taking the head off to do any work that's going to require drilling and tapping. I just that that was just one of those just as they say on Facebook, it was an SMH moment. Shake my head. Anybody see anything on this one? Anything obvious? 
Well, that's the, that's the oil dipstick, and that is the battery cable going to the starter. Ah, yeah, that's not good. That doesn't have any business rubbing up against that. Okay, now let me set up the scenario this way. You're buying this boat, and you've opened up the engine hatch, and this is what you see. Now tell me what you see. What else? Better open up every hatch. Why? Always bubble at everything. Let me change this freeze plugs. Thank you. Freeze plugs. See them here? Bronze. See them here? Painted. Steel. This one? Steel. Painted. Now they're all bronze. Those are the left one is factory. See all the rust? See all the rust? See new freeze plugs? That one still original. What else do you see? Starter looks awful new, doesn't it? Let's go one step further on the same boat. What is that little animal? It's Mastercraft Star and Stripes. It had the alternator on top of the motor. Seawater cooler, transmission. Looks a little new, doesn't it? New Teflon tape, new fittings, new clamps, shiny black. It's mounted underneath the motor. Same boat, same engine. Exhaust manifolds. PVC, first off. <laughs> it's not going to melt because this is the seawater. This is cold water. So it's not going to melt the fitting. Anybody see all the silicone slathered in here? Okay, so this is the same boat on all these pictures. This guy was buying this boat. So you've got a plastic fitting with silicone slathered. You've got obviously two brand new freeze plugs on one side. You've got rust trails coming down the side of the motor. It's an inland freshwater lake. It has every obvious sense that the motor's been frozen, hasn't been winterized properly, and you are now in trouble because you wrote the check two weeks ago for the boat. So when he brought it to me, he says it's not running really good. It's 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 it, it, it's underpowered. It's way underpowered. Yeah. Six cylinders on a V8 engine, it's underpowered, all right. <laughs> that turned into a twelve thousand dollar repower. Oh my god. Oh, when we did all the diagnosis, she had low compression on three cylinders. She had a blown head gasket, she had a cracked head from freezing. And the Mastercraft dealer that he bought it from had patched everything up and handed it to him, but sold him. With that little slip that you get with every used car and every boat that yeah. says what? Yeah. Paid yeah. hey, twelve thousand dollars for the boat, so he doubled his money to repower. He now has twenty-four thousand dollars in a nineteen seventy-eight Mastercraft, but he has one of the prettiest engines I ever built. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody in here ever seen my Facebook page? Seen the engine that's on my cover shot? Great right, big pretty Ford engine with a huge gentle brock sitting on top of it. That's what replaced that piece of junk. <laughs> it's a it's a it's a gorgeous engine. What what is that? That's a 302 Ford. We went back with the 351 Ford. Nice. I mean crate motor right out of the crate. We did a crate motor with uh, high performance add-ons. We changed the cam, we changed the carburetor, we changed the stringer. The winds are bolt right down under the stringers, wouldn't it? Nice, nice. Yeah, and, and, and if any other technician ever works on it, he'll never figure out the firing order because it's a 302 engine with a 351 firing order. You're bad. So what you end up doing with that motor when you come out? I mean, just jump, put it in the scrap pile? I couldn't even get a core return on yeah. it. It was too far gone. <clears throat> this, this, this by far has to be the most dangerous job I've ever done. Mm -hmm. Guy calls me on a 2,000 mile 31 Sea Ray Sundancer and says, "They just called me from the marina and said my shore power appears to be out. Can you go check it out for me?" <laughs> this is what I found behind the Hubble plug in his boat. And, and just for reference, this is an electrical tape. This is black duct tape. <laughs> what could be gorilla tape? We are rednecking it up first class here. Twisted wires together, which this is actually three strand solid core. And this is 10 marine grade wire. And then we've, we've twisted it together. We 
We wrapped it in some black duct tape and it held up for a couple of months until the power went out. Um, that, that one just absolutely scared me. I made a new harness. The reason I did this picture for this harness is I want to impress upon you color code. Color code on your AC wiring. Red, white, and green. Huh? Okay. Red, white, and green. They're all three important wires. You can use all three. If you don't have a green circuit on your boat, it's probably time to do some upgrading if you can. New outlets and a new breaker panel. The, old, the, the thing that makes this a little tricky is all of our commanders, the 12 volt wiring on it is what color code? Black and white. Black and white. White ground. AC, I said red, white, and green. I'm wrong. Sorry. Black, white, and green on the AC wiring. <clears throat> what makes it tricky is our 12 volt wiring on our commanders is black and white. Somebody tell me whether white is positive or negative. Neutral. It's negative. It's neutral? Yes, sir. And it's negative. That's what makes it tricky on our commanders. It's neutral on the shore power, on the 110 side. It's negative on the 12 volt side. And black, <coughs> which is what on the shore power? Common. Well, or load. Load which would be translated into that's one of your hotlines. And on your 12 volt side, black is hot. But in today's 12 volt wiring code, which is red and black, or red and, anybody else know the new wiring code for 12 volt? New color for ground? Green. Yellow. Who said that? You're correct. Give the lady, give the lady a prize. Isn't Chris Craft the opposite though? Uh, back then, was because I've had people come on my boat and look and say, "Why is it supposed to be ground?" But back then, was that standard? Back then, that was the standard. Every single white wire goes up to the bus bars yep. everywhere. All the twelve volt stuff. Everything that's white when your commander on the twelve volt panel is ground. Is that Chris Craft unique? Back Can't answer day? that question, and I'm not going to bluff my way through it. Yeah, I don't know. I don't either. No idea. Uh, the commanders are the only thing that I've worked with from our vintage. You know, everything else, that, everything else I work on on a daily basis. Is that what it is? Okay. Did everybody hear what he just said? No. Say it again. A little louder. Prior, prior to the late '60s or early '70s, they thought electricity went the other direction, and you actually had positive ground on tractors and old cars. Right. I remember the old Beatles that had positive ground on them, drive you nuts. But, and, and we're getting ready to wrap up. I got about two minutes left on this one, but let me tell you. Color coding, and, and I posted on this not long ago, it's really important on your boat. It's not just for your peace of mind. It's so when you bring a guy like me in and I come in and I open up the wiring closet, I can pretty much without a doubt know what I'm looking at. If I can't, if I don't know what I'm looking at, it's going to end up costing you because if I have to sit down and map it and figure it out, I get paid by the hour, people. <laughs> Quick question on that same vein. Answer something because I've never really had explained to me in layman's terms. Okay. On my boat, when I switched my, when I put the bridge on upstairs, I took out the old original ammeters, the old Stuart Warner ammeters, and I put in voltmeters. Right. I was told to disconnect the shunts from down below that run the, the original Chris Craft combination ammeters in the lower helm. So I was doing nothing at all bad by disconnecting the shunts. Got big, big white wires down there. Mm -hmm. And that shunt is the brick. Yeah, it's mm -hmm. kind of it's a squiggly corrugated piece. What does that do? And why is that not needed today? How come you can disconnect that and be fine? The shunt is put in line on a, a negative cable, okay? And the reason is because that's where your current flows. The, this, the squiggly part of the tin, and I'm just gonna tell you, I don't know this 100%, I've researched it, and this is the best answer I come up with. The reason that piece of copper strip going through there 
is corrugated like that is for cooling purposes. Heat, yeah. It's a, it's a heat shunt. Okay. Now, if you looked even closer on your shunt, you don't have two wires. You have four. The big, the big nuts on each end. That's your negative. That's your big negative cable. That's actually passing through. The screws that are on the end of those nuts that unscrew have two more smaller wires. They have what's called a positive and a negative. Those are what go up to your amp gauge. Those are what is reading the current going through. If you ask me how it reads, I'm going to answer you with my thermos bottle analogy. Thermos bottle. How do it know? Thermos bottle <laughs> keeps hot things hot, cold things cold. But the biggest question is how do it know? <laughs> sure. In about 30 seconds. That's good. That's good. The, uh, for weeks. <laughs> the animator you're describing with the shunt, yes. it, it does, it, you can't read that amperage going through directly because the end, you'd have to run that big battery cable all the way up to your dash and back. So what they do is they put that shunt in there and that shunt is actually a very, very low resistance piece of metal. It has a given uh, resistance to it. It's like a tenth of an ohm or something. Very low resistance. And they put the other two wires on top of it, and you're actually measuring the voltage drop over that resistance. So the more current that goes through it, the more voltage drop you have. And the meter that's up in your dashboard is actually a voltmeter that is calibrated to read out in amps as the voltage drop over that shunt varies with the amount of current going through. And that's why the shunt is so, the amp so meter, big. That's why if you don't have your amp meter anymore, you can take the shunt out. All it was was you take the shunt out, you put the two big cables back yeah. together. Yeah, the interesting but, thing. But truthfully, the shunt's not causing you any problem. You can leave it hooked up. Yeah. Yeah. You could leave it hooked up or take it out. Yeah. And the, the reason for the coil is that it dissipates the heat. You dissipate the heat. Like your heat whole load's going yeah. through that. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, the load goes through that, so you can run small wires through that. Do we have any other questions? By the way, this is how the shore power project I was doing ended up. And I want you to notice on most of our commanders, you have that reverse polarity light. Everybody still has that, the red and the yellow lights on your shore power. On the sea rays, they're actually using a main breaker right at the Hubble plug now. And I thought that was a good idea, so I went ahead and took a picture of it. If you ever decide to upgrade your shore power, uh, Marion Co. or Hubble, either one, makes that setup, and it's just simply a 30 amp double throw uh, breaker. And you can put it in line, and that way you plug in, you can throw the breaker, and you've got one more piece of protection on your shore power system before you fry anything else. Yeah? I know you just a quick question on shore power. I was on hardware recently, I forgot what hardware, but the whole time I was plugged in the polarity light was on. Uh-huh. And I found that it wasn't the boat and it wasn't how I plugged it in, it was the hubble was one way. Right. I figured when they wired the harbor. Yep. It happens. Okay, I just figured the whole harbor was wrong. Well, the, uh, uh, I just went through this, that same kind of issue on our uh, yacht club. Uh, we, put, we have a hundred slips, and there may be a couple of slips where the when they wired the, the connection on the shore side that the polarity was switched. Mm -hmm. And so, because we moved uh, slam from the slip that we bought her in down to another slip, everything worked fine. Took the boat out to the party dock, everything worked fine. And I got. I got 50 amp, double 50 amps on both sides. They moved this again to uh, a longer slit, plugged in, blew the damn uh, circuit breaker on the 400 amp shore power panel at the uh, dock side because the polarity was wrong in the wire, uh, on the connection on the dock. So it, Okay, I don't. Well, the polarity was wrong on the outlet side on the dock that I was plugging my shore cables into. And so the what we ended up I mean, we ended up putting the meter on it and then finally yeah, when we figured that out, then took the, the cable loose and switched the wire. And so that wire is my dock side wire and I know how right. I set up. I don't have it with me, but let me let me just tell you, Home Depot sells an outlet checker. They ever seen it's a little square, it's got two prongs and has some LED lights in it. And it will actually check polarity of an outlet. Now, the way you do it on a shore power plug, you go to West Marine Port Supply, wherever your boating store is, and you get a shore power adapter that will plug into your dock side where you can plug a drop cord in, get that piece, go to Home Depot and get the outlet checker, 
you plug it in, you read the lights, you know whether the polarity is right before you plug your boat in. Is that an easy fix? It'll cost you. I think those, if I remember right, the adapters at West Marine are like 30 or 40 bucks for the little plug-in adapter, and then Home Depot, you're probably looking five at the most. Or 95. Yeah, mm -hmm. the outlet checks. Okay, let's take about a five-minute break, and, and the second seminar is just going to kind of feed off the first one, and we'll do more discussion, and I have more pictures. Mm -hmm.